in every single moment of spare time I've had in like the last month, I have been playing Unicorn Overlord. The only reason I haven't talked about it on the channel so far is because I've been playing Unicorn Overlord. The moral of the story is I would like to directly inject Unicorn Overlord into my veins. Please. But seriously, I have actually been playing nothing but Unicorn Overlord since it released. I'm actually kind of glad that I haven't talked about it yet because like 60, 80 hours into it, whatever I am at the moment, I'm still discovering new mechanics and utilizing mechanics that were told to me 40 plus hours ago and I just haven't got around to using it. So this is a proper deep dive into the game, not just my first thoughts, which is probably what we would have gotten if I didn't get so obsessed. So let's start out with the story, because the story isn't really the reason I'm so addicted to it. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's okay. It's just nothing spectacular. It's nothing special. Classic medieval RPG. Land gets taken over by bad guy. Young dude survives. Young dude grows up and then tries to reclaim land from bad guy. You are the young dude. Basically, that's it. Don't get me wrong, it is still interesting. It does still have a lot going for it, but it is on that ground level, kind of basic. What I do really like about the story though, is that each individual character you meet along your journey, of course, it's an RPG, you add to your party as you go along. Each individual character, their story is fleshed out really, really well. So, you are able to care about any random little side character that you happen to encounter and recruit to your army. I am a huge fan of this girl just because when I encountered her, she had the hots for me. So, I was like, okay, you can be in my team indefinitely now. Because I think it's hilarious that you just want to get with me, basically, <laughs> you know? And from there, I've built this relationship with this individual character and I just like using her in battle. On the other hand though, if for some reason you don't care about any individual character story, they don't really have too much sway on the overarching plot. So it is really easy to just ignore characters if they're not for you. So they've done this in a really, really smart way where there's enough there to care about if you want, but not so much that you're forced to care. Does that make sense? So you're really able to pick and choose what characters you like and what characters you want to use. And you're really able to tailor that to your own unique taste of characters and stories. But the mechanics, the mechanics and the gameplay is where this game really, really shines and is the reason that I'm wanting to inject it straight into my veins. Now I'm not going to go over every little mechanic or go into a deep dive and explain to you how the combat works. Honestly, it would probably get a little boring, which I know sounds counterintuitive. You just describe the combat as boring. No, I just think if you're not eased into it as you progress in the story over like, honestly, like 15-ish hours, then it's gonna seem like a lot really fast and nobody wants me to just go over the math of the game. That's not fun. It's fun when you just add a little bit extra each battle you're in until all of a sudden you're using all of these like dozens of mechanics at your disposal to help you in your tactical battles. So as I just said, it is a tactical RPG. It's more like RTS, real-time strategy, something akin to Age of Empires. But also it's not like that because you spend a lot of your time with the game paused. So you are still able to give your units commands and skills and all of that stuff while the game is paused. It just doesn't, you know, send your unit towards the other one. And this is going to be an interesting point of contention because some people are going to say, why didn't they just make it grid orientated? turn based, you know, because you do spend so much of it with the game paused. But I really enjoy the RTS type of gameplay here. I think it works really well. And the fact that you do spend most of the game in pause is not really 
here nor there. You know, instead of having your units move slowly and you command them as they're slowly moving, you just pause and then unpause and they run. It's really that simple. I'm a fan. I understand if you're not though. And the tactics, man. Oof, the tactics in this game are hectic. There is so many different levels to the tactical gameplay. First of all, obviously, you've got each individual character's skills, stats, and then obviously items they can equip. Then you have to order your skills because you can't just activate any old skill any old time. Oh, nay, nay. In fact, you have actually very little control over said skills. You just have to order them pre-battle and then in battle, they'll just auto battle. They'll auto skill in battle. Hopefully I'm explaining this good. So you've got the order of said skills. You've got a, I want you to try attacking this front row first. If that fails, why don't you attack the flyers in the back row, so on and so forth. Then you've got to combine all of your individual characters into one military unit. So then you've got to think about how all these different skills play off of each other. Am I going to activate my healing skill when my other characters are below 50% health? Or am I going to wait until they're below 25% health to hopefully heal more? And then you can expand said military units and upgrade your characters as well. So all of a sudden it goes from just one single character's skills and abilities to playing a huge role in the overarching military unit. And then those military units, each individual one of those, plays off each other as well and is good in different roles depending on what characters are in them. See, I'm already getting boring here. What you should take away from this is that there is just so many levels to tactical gameplay. If you're into any kind of tactical RPG, whether that be RTS like Age of Empires or your more traditional Fire Emblem or Advanced Wars or something along those lines, you are going to have so much fun here. I'm personally a fan of all of those things, and I think that might be the reason why I'm a little bit obsessed. So what gets me excited, this tactical gameplay, is probably going to turn a lot of people off. If you're not excited about tactical RPGs, then like this is just straight up not for you, and that's okay. So these tactical battles take place in a different perspective, I guess you would say. So as you can see on the screen here right now, You've got these beautiful backdrops with these 2D models in front of it and they're attacking each other. And this is also where all the cutscenes take place as well inside this perspective. So whenever you have an individual character that you're wanting to pay attention to, like in a battle or in a story segment, it's going to be in this perspective. And I'm a huge fan of this perspective just because I really like the art style here. I really like those dynamic backgrounds. They just look so nice. And the character designs themselves are pretty special. And the other perspective where most of the game takes place is something that looks like this. So the overworld is actually, it's actually an open world where all your battles are taking place within this world. You don't load into a separate battle screen. It is all happening in this little overworld. And as you can see, you've got your little cute guy there, almost has this like 16 bit kind of retro vibe going onto it. Not that it is, but it just gives me that little vibe and I think it's safe to say that we all know that Tom loves a little bit of retro vibes, especially those 8 16-bit styles. So to having like a little callback to that without actually being that just really, really tickles my fancy. And I think both of these different art styles work so well together. If it was just one or the other for the whole game, I feel like it might get a little bit old. But together, they really complement one another and they do each other a massive service. Now, I did mention in the intro that there are a bunch of mechanics that I've only just started to discover. One of which is the romance options. Now, unfortunately in this game, as with, I find this in a lot of games actually, 
the romance options just seem to be tacked on at the end as an afterthought. Oh wait, we'll just add a stat that increases when characters talk to each other or when characters take place in the same battles and then you can get that high enough and you can marry him and there's a little bit of extra dialogue. And like, okay, that's cool. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's nice to have. I just feel like it's not very well thought out in a lot of games and unfortunately Unicorn Overlord does suffer from that. I'm not really huge on romance options anyway. Take it or leave it. Never got married in Stardew Valley for example. But <laughs> it's there. If you want it, it's there. And I'm sure if you're into that kind of thing, you will have a good time trying to figure out, you know, who you're going to romance and who you're going to get with. And the options are not limited, by the way. Any character you wish to get a bit of woohoo with, you can get a little bit of woohoo with. Hiring units is also something I never really did until I, I realized I had to take footage for this video actually. I was like, oh yeah, you can hire mercenaries in this game to join your army. I just went with all the characters that the story gave you naturally. I found that was more than enough. If you fall in love with the wizard class and you think the wizard class is just the best thing and you'd like to have an army full of wizards, you can just go and hire 10, 12 wizards. To join your army and you can play in that style if you want. If you fall in love with one specific play style of one specific character or class then you can just go all out on that. I use the hiring of the units to kind of explore different options, characters I'd missed in the story along the way and I personally like to have variety and like have a little bit of everything in my army but hey if you've got some kind of tactical setup in your head and you're like i need three swordsmen for this by all means hire three swordsmen there is a little bit of character customization in this i say a little bit it's, it's okay fairly basic stuff hair changes voice color of your outfit so on and so forth i don't think it's anything to write home about it's nice that it's there at least and you can make your own little minions mercenaries that you hire your own but i eh, eh. and then one of the other little mechanics i like is that you can build up the towns that you are saving along the way so they all start pretty you know dilapidated you'll deliver them some fish and some ore and some wood and then all of a sudden they'll have a port there that port can then take you to secret hidden locations or easy access to other locations on the map. So it is in your best interest to build up as many towns as you can. Not to mention that this also gives you in-game currency, which you can then use to upgrade your units and so on. So all these little mechanics are there if you want. You don't have to take advantage of any of them if you don't want to but it is within your best interest to do so as it might make the game more entertaining easier more streamlined so on and so forth and i think that's where unicorn overlord has really hit the nail on the head they've made this game that is super expansive and with so many things to do and so many things to learn but they don't force any of that on you at all if you just want to play through story mode, which is obviously the easiest difficulty, then you don't have to learn any of the tactical combat, really. You could just cruise through nonchalantly and just have a decent time listening to the story. Or if you want to take things super far and go super hard and really, really dive deep into those tactical mechanics, then you can also do that. I really, really like it when a game accommodates to many audiences and many playstyles. And this game has done that so well. Even down to the side quests. Yeah, you can do them if you want. There's a little bit of extra story stuff there. Or you might free another couple of towns to help you along your way. Or you might get another character. But you don't have to. You don't have to do shit in this game. And I really really like that about it. You know what else you don't have to do? You don't have to click those like and subscribe buttons down there, but I sure would appreciate it. See, I'm like Unicorn Overlord. You don't have to do anything, but there's some rewards for doing it. Don't know what the rewards are yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there one day.
So hopefully all of this has made sense. I kind of feel like I just rambled on a little bit. I'm sorry if it doesn't make sense. If I get to editing this video later and I just decide it doesn't make sense, I'm uploading it anyway because I've spent long enough not talking about Unicorn Overlord. Let me know what you guys think about it though. Have you played it at all? Are you a fan of Atlas and Vanillaware? Also, let me know if you don't plan on picking it up. Why not? Why not? You're missing out on a great game. Or are you just not into real-time strategy? That is fine too. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I will talk to you in the comments below. See you later.